Great. Um, so I want to say thank you to Danica and to the lecture committee um, for the invitation today. Um, I'm really excited to be in such good company for this semester's lecture series. And um, I feel that framing the future is a really um, relevant theme uh, for the work that I'm gonna show today. So um, the projects that I am going to go through today are anchored by the concept um, of what I call issues-based design. And by that, I mean design that responds to social, economic, or political issues by reframing a problem through the lens of the built environment. Another way to, the, to describe this is that design um, doesn't begin with a specific site or a specific program but it emerges from the observation and analysis of a particular problem. And so before um, I get into some of the design work, I wanted to share um, a quote from a short 2016 essay by Michael Rock, um, who is on the faculty at Columbia University um, and a partner in the design firm Two by Four. He writes that unlike words, the meaning of which can be debated, the objective materiality of designed objects exudes a unique power. Once established, it's difficult to think outside the systems and structures these objects represent. And his essay um, uses the infamous North Carolina bathroom bill and the design of gendered public restrooms as an example of how an ingrained architectural code can seem immutable because it's everywhere. And I believe this extends to the whole of the built environment and especially the accumulation of buildings and pieces of architecture around us. We tend to be so absorbed by architecture that it often becomes invisible. And with the work I'm gonna to show today, I'm hoping um, to push back a bit against that instinct and to argue for a higher consciousness about architecture and also for an architecture that is more conscientiously created. So I'm gonna begin um, by showing work from two recent studios that I've taught at the University of Illinois in both architecture and landscape architecture. Um, and the first is Design for COVID-19, Rethinking the University Campus, um, which I just taught this past fall online. During the summer of 2020, um, after initial COVID lockdowns had eased in certain places around the world, um, we started to see various pop-up designs um, to allow for social distancing in the short term. These ranged from prefab structures for isolated dining to pavilions for outdoor learning to various forms of graphic overlay on the ground plane um, to mark the boundaries of these new six foot personal bubbles that we were trying to stay within. At the same time, university campuses were forced to think at a large scale and on a much longer timeline about how they could respond safely to the pandemic while allowing some degree of continuity um, in their educational endeavors and for their community. Um, the campus is a unique typology in the built environment, an attempt to create a small utopia of self-governance, education, and academic freedom, often using classical planning techniques. So the University of Illinois is um, sort of archetypal in this sense. Its quadrangles, its long axes, and its neoclassical focal points um, sort of mixed in with more nondescript brick facades of the late 20th century are the core ingredients of the American college campus. That in combination with the university's uh, aggressive and highly competent pandemic response plan made it a really excellent case study for this studio. Um, these were the conditions that made us made it possible for us to think about new urban and architectural design ideas that could be implemented in the long term, setting us up to think about other campuses as well. So the goal of the studio was to propose new urban designs for two sites on campus, which are highlighted here. Um, both sites contain undergraduate residential buildings, um, and that was part of the design challenge for the students, but they also represented opportunities for rethinking outdoor occupancies, connectivity, and ecologies. 
Um, the design proposals would be, of course, prompted by the pandemic, but would also seek to outlast it, creating new kinds of campus experiences that are pandemic ready, but also urbanistically transformative. Um, so these are the two sites that we worked on in a bit more detail. Um, one is uh, the home of Allen Hall, which is kind of a large um, undergraduate residential hall. Um, and the other are the Illinois Street residences, um, which are kind of multiple buildings that contain undergraduate dormitories. So you can see that, um, for example, with the ISR site, um, there's a lot of parking lot surface. Um, with the Allen Hall site, there's a lot of um, lawn that is kind of uniform across the site. Um, and so the sites really presented opportunities for us to think um, quite deeply about the design of the ground plane itself um, and how that could become a way to kind of guide social distancing, but also um, introduce kind of new urban ideas into the campus context. So I'm just going to show um, some examples of projects from the course. Um, this one developed a hexagonal paving strategy across um, the ISR site, um, thinking about how uh, pavers could actually be scaled according to social distancing guidelines um, and use that language to create not just a new ground plane, but also a series of semi-enclosed structures that could be used for outdoor dining, small seminars, um, or more private outdoor space for dormitories. Another project uses zipper-like paving strategy to create a new set of pathways throughout the Allen Hall site, linking together plazas of different scales and geometries, creating alternately sunlit and shaded zones for different outdoor occupancies. Um, and again, here the materials are scaled and positioned to kind of subtly guide people into six foot buffer zones and to help maintain that distance throughout the site. Um, some other examples of projects, um, one used the kind of classical form of the amphitheater, um, but played with the materiality of it, um, creating this kind of striping strategy um, that was again dimensioned um, using that six foot module um, to sort of guide the way that people would be able to kind of occupy these amphitheaters. Um, another sort of took on the question of occupancy during the night and um, proposed a sort of light landscape um, for, again, the Allen Hall site um, that would use kind of embedded lighting panels in the ground um, to show what was being occupied at what time. Um, and so they would be sort of, um, they would respond to pressure from someone walking across them. So you get this kind of dynamic light landscape that also tells us about occupancy and kind of that someone coming and that we might need to kind of keep from them. Um, another project um, used the possibilities of textures and colors with concrete um, to sort of create a coded spaces for different kinds of um, movement. So pedestrian, bicycle, um, skateboard. Um, so different sort of like types of traffic were um, organized into these two layers. Um, and then that had a relationship with the architecture that was eventually produced. Um, another project um, on the ISR site introduced a series of new courtyards, um, each one with its own materiality and identity um, that would actually kind of use the materials on the ground um, to again, sort of give directionality um, to guide um, the occupation of these kind of six foot zones of space. Um, but as you can see, the sort of the, the running theme throughout the projects is um, an initial response to the pandemic, um, but also thinking about just new types of campus spaces um, and how these can become occupiable in different ways um, after we kind of get through this particular time. Uh, here's another um, sort of material drawing from that same project. And this one is kind of introducing um, a use of planting in addition to hardscape um, as a way to kind of create these new boundaries. So looking at the buildings on these sites themselves, um, this is the um, current plan of Allen Hall. 
Um, and so one of the things that the university is kind of dealing with is, um, for example, the dimensions of existing hallways and how those don't really allow um, for two people to pass by each other um, in a safe way under current safety guidelines. Um, the university's also had to think about kind of reducing um, the number of people who are actually occupying the dorms. And so these were the sort of questions um, and issues that were in our minds as we were thinking about how do you actually rethink the floor plan of the building itself. Um, so just a couple examples here. Um, students uh, were really interested in opening up the circulation spaces, um, giving a lot more sort of dimension over to um, hallways, but also thinking about hallways ways as more than just a corridor, but a space that can actually be programmed itself. Um, and so you'll see in these plans some sort of different ideas about um, patterning on the on the ground itself, sort of bringing in some of those ideas of um, paving and patterning on the outside, bringing them into the building, um, thinking about how we can include um, flexible classroom space within the dormitory buildings um, for different sort of um, number occupancy numbers based on um, how, how many people can be in uh, a space at a given time. I also looked at the design of individual dorm rooms, um, again, using materials, colors, textures to create safe passageway zones on the building interior. Um, and in these examples, you can see many more opportunities for access to the outdoors directly from a dorm room. Um, we also had a few projects that proposed entirely new residential buildings. Um, this one was a new campus gateway, um, creating interesting kinds of outdoor space, um, as well as an atrium that would allow people to pass each other on separate pathways while still, be able, still being able to engage socially. Um, this was a new building proposed specifically for graduate students or students with families families. Um, and this one sort of addressed the issue of ventilation and air circulation um, by creating a floor plan that allowed apartments to kind of stretch all the way across the building. Um, so you could create cross ventilation within each apartment. Um, and the stairs and elevators are kind of grouped into these central cores. Um, and so I thought this was a really kind of nice example of very intelligent um, organization of some sort of basic kit of parts um, that would address the, the issue of cross ventilation quite directly. Um, and I think the, the projects ultimately made a really persuasive case for um, certainly thinking about the outdoors, um, but also how important the efficiency and quality and flexibility of our interior spaces is. Um, I think that's something that the COVID experience has made abundantly clear. Um, and I'm really glad that we were able to explore it at so many different scales in the studio. Um, and I, th I think the course kind of achieved what I had hoped um, at the very beginning, which was that starting with COVID um, and starting with those social distancing guidelines um, as a kind of as a way into this bigger question of campus design and cam campus urbanism, um, it led us to a really wide variety um, of proposals um, that all started with the same problem, but we kind of ended up with a um, really diverse set of, of proposals. Um, so I was really happy with um, how the work turned out for this course. Um, the second studio I'd like to talk about um, is from a few years ago. Um, it's called Landscapes of Dependence, and I taught it in the Department of Landscape Architecture as a design workshop, um, which is a vertical studio. So it included both undergraduates and graduate students in landscape architecture. Um, and this is where um, I'm gonna kind of move into talking about um, the opioid epidemic. Um, and so there's kind of, a, a, there's a bit of a connection um, between the two studios in terms of kind of dealing in general with these large scale public health issues um, and using design as kind of a mechanism to help alleviate them. So um, this is a graphic from uh, the CDC um, that shows a bit about uh, the sort of semi-recent history of the opioid epidemic. Um, and my course was really focused on these last, um, the last two years in this graphic. So basically from 2017 onwards. Um, where we see kind of a significant spike in the use of synthetic opioids. Um, 
And there's, there's a really kind of complex reason for this that I will get into a little bit. Um, but it was, this was around the time that um, this particular epidemic gained um, quite a bit of traction in media. Um, and one of the things that I realized that you can see um, with um, this sort of uh, bulleted list from the CDC is that um, while all of the sort of um, the mechanisms that were put in place to deal with the epidemic um, were really well intentioned um, and in a lot of cases well organized. Um, there was, for me, there was a kind of dimension missing and it was the dimension of the built environment and what role the built environment played in um, sort of allowing the epidemic to uh, grow in the way that it did, and also what changes to the built environment we could make that might help to alleviate some of these problems. Um, and so I started out by kind of looking at um, the, the national map and trying to understand sort of what were some of the territorial um, connections between places that had been severely affected by this epidemic. Um, and so the, the areas that are darkest here um, were ones that were um, most greatly affected by um, fatal overdoses. Um, and so through kind of a series of maps, um, I tried to sort of set up the problem in a way that my students could then respond with design proposals. Um, and so the first thing we did is we talked about, well, um, what happens when we kind of move away from thinking about um, political borders, in this case, kind of the county border, um, that tends to be a sort of um, arbitrary and sometimes gerrymandered border um, that in a sense doesn't really tell us anything um, when we're looking at um, an epidemic that is um, sort of focused in areas for different kinds of reasons. Um, and they're not necessarily um, limited to state borders or county borders. And so kind of removing those borders is a first step to sort of helping us think about how we can read the landscape in a different way. So once we do that, we start to see some larger scale links that are taking place. Um, so for example, um, I-95, which um, has been sort of known as um, a pipeline for um, especially the, the black market trade in opioids um, and heroin. And so um, once we start to sort of look at where this highway actually connects to, um, we see that it has become a kind of uh, a channel for a lot of these um, regions that have been highly affected. And so um, it, we, we start to understand kind of a connection across a much larger geography than just the county or the state. Um, we can look at environmental links as well. Um, this is a map um, showing coal beds and coal mines. Um, and there actually turns out to be quite um, an important link between uh, areas that have these kinds of landscapes um, and increased opioid use. Um, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail um, in a few minutes, but basically it has to do with um, the sorts of illnesses that come along with um, working in coal mines and the prescription of opioids um, by doctors that then leads to a dependency. We can also understand um, the sort of spike in um, overdose, fatal overdoses um, by looking at the landscape of healthcare facilities and how um, access is sort of higher in urban areas. It's sort of more facilities are clustered in urban areas, um, but the kind of shift to um, rural areas has sort of made it uh, less easy for people who actually have the problems to access the kinds of healthcare that they need. So the studio structure um, was sort of broken down into three parts. Um, the first was to go through an exercise of kind of visualizing the territories that had been affected. Um, the second was to diagnose the problem and to reframe it through landscape. And then the third was to articulate design strategies that um, hope to kind of rehabilitate, uh, not just the land the, uh, themselves. 
So we started out with um, kind of a big brainstorming session um, as a group. And um, the goal was to try and chart out, well, what exactly has led to this epidemic? Well, who are all of the different actors involved? What are all the different processes involved? Um, and so we spent the first week kind of building up uh, lists and diagrams um, and it, all of that information got kind of contained into um, a, a diagram that sort of guided us through the semester. So um, one of the, the sort of tropes that emerges um, when we're looking at this issue is this, this idea of the cycle of addiction, that addiction is sort of people get caught in a cycle um, that will sometimes lead to an overdose that then will lead to withdrawal that will lead to addiction again. Um, and the onus is kind of on the individual here. Um, and the assumption is that um, the, uh, that remediation comes through medication um, or it comes through a kind of like attending a rehab facility. Um, and what we wanted to do was kind of push past this and say, well, what if it's not just this kind of cycle of individual pain and um, sort of like guilt and failure, um, trying to sort of move past those more um, abstract uh, issues um, and think about, well, what happens when we actually look at the larger network of things that are going on? Um, and so as we started to map this, we saw um, that there was kind of a role for pharmaceuticals, um, for the healthcare industry, um, for local institutions um, like law enforcement and prisons and courthouses, um, that there was a link, a growing link to the black market, um, that there was a relationship to um, federal policy and um, federal positions um, and federal funding that there was a relationship to the environment and the landscape. And that these things started to get really interconnected. Um, and so that the cycle um, of addiction actually becomes something more, um, something more like a labyrinth. Um, and so the idea that um, the responsibility is on the individual um, we, we were really trying to sort of um, challenge that concept by visualizing the problem in a different way. And so the studio ended up focusing um, on this kind of environment, the, the set of environmental nodes. Um, and the students were sort of um, given freedom in a sense to kind of decide what dimension of this they wanted to tackle. Um, and so some students worked uh, more with the kind of tactile materials of landscape. Um, some worked with the idea of kind of pharmaceutical networks and hospital networks. Um, and so again, by kind of all starting with the same problem, um, we ended up with a really diverse array of solutions and ideas. Um, so th throughout the studio um, in the kind of research Portion, we looked at the history um, of opium and opioid use. Um, we looked at the way um, in the past it's been advertised. Um, so for example, on the right, we see um, an advertisement for mothers to give their children, their teething children, morphine. Um, so obviously sort of public perception um, and public opinions about this have changed significantly since the 19th century. Um, we looked at the kind of global footprint that um, poppy cultivation um, and opioid um, opium extraction have. Um, we looked at the different kinds of vehicles that are used um, in different drug trades. Um, so we really tried to kind of cast a wide net in terms of um, what are all of the different kinds of environmental conditions that are involved in this problem. Um, several students became interested in the kind of Kentucky and West Virginia area and the relationships between um, mining and drinking water contamination um, and the illnesses that result from that and then eventual opioid use. Um, and so these are some examples of the kinds of uh, water contamination that occur in those areas. And then the design proposals um, ranged um, across uh, 
uh, different regions in the United States. We had some students working in the Northeast, um, several in uh, the Appalachian region, um, and then one in Miami, um, kind of addressing the I-95 infrastructure, um, and one in Laredo, Texas, looking at um, the US-Mexico border. So I'm just gonna go through a few of these projects. Um, one in West Virginia, um, thought about how the Appalachian Trail um, could be extended and um, that a network of trails could become a kind of place for um, increased outdoor exercise, um, sort of using the landscape as a, as a rehabilitation facility in a sense, um, and also taking the opportunity to kind of um, redesign the landscape at the domestic level as well. Um, and so again, you know, the students were starting with a problem, but they were arriving at um, proposals that were um, much farther reaching. So they were wanting to remediate um, the issue of opioid use, but also um, just thinking about the experience of the everyday landscape and how that can be improved. Another project um, sort of drew from the kind of graph diagram that we developed um, as a class and thought about um, how to rethink um, the political infrastructure around this problem. Um, and in this case, sort of rethinking um, NAFTA and how those relationships can be um, further sort of bolstered by um, the, the actual agriculture of um, poppy byproducts and then introducing milkweed um, as another kind of major uh, agricultural crop that can be traded. Um, so this project looked at kind of redesigning um, the border condition itself in Laredo, um, the, the border crossing experience and the ecological health of the site. Um, and also um, at an infrastructural scale between Mexico and Canada, um, introducing the milkweed as um, a kind of crop that would sit alongside uh, the highway um, and sort of be a sort of low impact um, opportunity for cultivation. So these are some examples of um, what those new highway typologies would look like. And another project um, from the studio that um, I thought was particularly interesting um, challenged the, the very premise of the course, um, which I was really glad about. Um, this student um, came to me and said, you know, I've been thinking about this and I actually really don't think that landscape um, architecture or the kind of um, redesigning of a particular site can actually alleviate this problem. And so what she did instead is um, she approached uh, using the landscape as a reflection of uh, the stages uh, that one goes through during um, a kind of an addiction experience. And so she related different emotions to um, different uh, landscape elements and forms um, and basically produced a kind of sequence um, that people could move through as a way of sort of introspection about um, opioid addiction. And so these are some of those different types of spaces that she produced. Um, and what I thought was really interesting was the kind of um, surreal and hazy quality of um, the images in the end. Um, and it was just sort of a very different approach um, from some of the other projects that I really appreciated. Um, another dimension of this course was that we had a series of guest lectures um, from professionals in medicine, um, in environmental studies, um, as well as Elaine Sheldon, who's a filmmaker um, from West Virginia who made the film Heroin um, with an E at the end um, that uh, follows three women as they kind of deal with um, the epidemic in their hometown in West Virginia. Um, and the primary deliverable for the course um, was actually a website called the Declaration of Dependence, um, where we gathered um, all the research and the precedent studies and the proposals um, and have kept this as both a document of the course, but also a manifesto about 
um, the role of design in these kind of large scale social and public health problems um, and where we see that we can make a difference and where we kind of acknowledge that um, our work has limitations and that this really has to be a kind of um, all hands on deck approach. Um, so it's design, working with public policy, um, working with sort of different levels of infrastructure um, to, to try and actually address the issue. But I think the, the point we wanted to make is that design absolutely has a role, um, that the built environment is not fixed, that the built environment can be changed, um, and that those changes um, can sort of help alleviate some of the problems that we see. Um, and what was great about the website is that um, we were actually able to incorporate it into um, our reviews. And so this is an image from our final review um, where the students um, have some of the more traditional printed boards, but then everyone also included um, an iPad in their presentation and were able to kind of use the website um, to show more of their work. Um, and the, the course um, had a really nice essay written um, by Zach Mortis in Landscape Architecture Magazine. Um, and this is still online if you're interested in reading about it. Um, Zach was able to visit during our final review um, and wrote a really great assessment of, of the class. Um, and then I was also able to um, present our findings and our proposals um, at an event called a Millennial Manifesto. Um, how Millennials Will Save the World. Um, and it, we had this really nice venue um, in downtown Chicago um, and it was kind of a, it was hosted by um, the Illinois ASLA. Um, and we were able to kind of talk about um, different ways in which uh, landscape architecture um, and teaching about landscape architecture um, could deal with large scale social issues. So looking at the opioid epidemic um, in a studio um, actually kind of opened up some bigger questions for me um, that I was able to receive funding for through the Campus Research Board. Um, and so this is an ongoing project. So I'm gonna show just a few images from this. Um, so one of the things that I realized as I was reading um, more about the opioid epidemic is that there is this sort of particular issue um, that I think requires some special attention. Um, and it's called neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, and that term is basically describes the withdrawal that newborns experience when um, their mothers used opioids regularly during pregnancy. Um, and in this, in this case, with this particular issue, it's not often um, illicit use of drugs, it sometimes is, um, but rather it stems from a dependency that grows um, from, a, uh, from a prescription that's given by a doctor. And so um, the, I, like, I'm interested in addressing this issue because of, um, again, my, my realization that um, there are design opportunities available that don't really show up in a lot of the literature um, that kind of take this question on. Um, and so what I have found is that two clear ways in which um, we can sort of design opportunities with neonatal abstinence syndrome. And the first is in its geography. Um, and so similarly to um, how we see kind of a rural shift more recently with opioid use in general, um, it's the same pattern with neonatal abstinence syndrome. And that shift has created a misalignment between where the problem is becoming worse and where the resources to treat it are located. Um, newborns who are um, afflicted with this uh, need to be in a neonatal intensive care unit. Um, and those tend to be clustered in cities um, and sort of farther away from where the problem is growing at the moment. Um, and so, the, so the, there's a the geographic scale. Um, and then the second opportunity is at the architectural scale. Um, and with the design of the NICU um, itself, which has traditionally been an open floor plan. Um, to allow for ease of access by hospital staff. Um, but the difference with NAS is that um, treatment is 
uh, it's supposed to include extended proximity to the mother. Um, it's supposed to include activities like breastfeeding, um, which require higher degrees of privacy. And so the term rooming in um, describes spaces where parents can stay overnight in a NICU facility. Um, and that's been shown to speed up the recovery of infants in withdrawal. Um, and so there is kind of a very clear architectural design challenge, I think, that emerges by looking at this problem. Um, and so just to kind of summarize um, the issues uh, are withdrawal symptoms, um, the length of stay, um, and related to that, the cost per child um, in the NICU. And the design opportunities um, come with sort of thinking about where are new locations and types of facilities possible, um, and how can we think about the, the actual kind of interior layout and organization of the NICU um, to provide more opportunities for rooming in, um, more uh, opportunities for families to spend time together. So looking at Illinois, um, it's, it's quite useful um, because Illinois sort of, uh, the, the way in which NAS has emerged in this state um, is representative basically of the way it's emerged in the rest of the country. Um, so this is a map of um, the existing healthcare facilities in Illinois, um, kind of grouped into three categories. Uh, the black is the general hospital. Um, the gray is what's called a critical access hospital, um, which the CAHs receive um, federal funding. Um, and then the white are the rural health clinics. Um, and overlaid on that, um, we can see where um, NICU facilities in Illinois are located. So you can see that the majority of them um, with the larger bed counts are kind of grouped in, in and around Chicago. Um, and outside of that area, um, there are only four, um, four facilities. Um, and as you can see, none in Southern Illinois. Um, and the total bed count that's available in those four facilities is 204. Um, and so when we look at uh, the NAS rates in Illinois, um, the, the darker hatching that you see um, is kind of a higher rate and the lighter hatching is a lower rate. Um, and so a lot of these are kind of um, distanced from NICU facilities. Um, and so they're the, the kind of the misalignment um, that I mentioned earlier sort of emerges as we go through this process of mapping uh, this problem. So um, in uh, the data that I have is from 2016. And so there were over 2300 NAS cases in the state. Um, and uh, out if you sort of subtract Cook and DuPage counties, um, they're 1399. And so if you kind of think about in that in comparison to the number of beds that are available, which are just a couple of hundred um, outside the Chicagoland area, um, there is kind of a significant need for um, an increased number of facilities and really thinking about what those facilities can provide. Um, and just to kind of uh, go back to the sort of the question of the, the rural shift, um, outlined in Magenta are um, the counties that uh, qualify as rural, um, according to the Illinois Health and Hospital Association. Um, and so most of the counties that have kind of the higher NAS rates also qualify as rural. Um, and so it's just really important to kind of pay attention to these geographic shifts and think about how can this information guide us to locating um, new pieces of architecture appropriately um, in places that uh, you know, it can actually make a difference. So part of um, this kind of ongoing research um, is documenting the existing NICU facilities. Um, and so there are 29 that serve um, Illinois residents. Um, the four that are highlighted in gray are actually in St. Louis, um, but they're just over the border. And so Illinois residents um, are able to use them. And then the four in turquoise are um, the ones that are outside of the Chicago area. Um, and so pre-COVID restrictions, um, but, you know, my original research plan was to visit all of these sites and to kind of document um, the, 
the layouts of each of their NICUs. Um, and so right now I'm kind of reframing the project a bit um, and figuring out how I can kind of acquire that information virtually. Um, but one of the sort of dimensions of this project is to basically document um, all of the existing NICUs and um, start to kind of categorize them based on what type of layouts they have. Um, and so the existing literature on NICU design um, basically kind of groups them into two major categories. Um, and it's kind of open versus closed. Um, so we see an example of that, uh, the open on the left and the closed on the right. And basically what that means is um, the, the beds are all kind of, um, the, there are basically no walls between the beds in um, the open layout, which allows the staff to basically be able to more easily monitor the children um, versus the closed layout on the right, um, which is basically kind of it, its own room. Um, so there's a folding couch um, where parents can stay overnight if they want to, um, but then it also kind of creates um, a greater uh, distance between the hospital staff and the child. Um, so monitoring isn't as easy. Um, and so the question for me is, um, you know, these are two paradigms. What, what is the third paradigm? Um, what is the hybrid condition? Um, and so the, the design project that's gonna come out of this is thinking about um, a new NICU typology that potentially hybridizes these two, but um, it's also looking for you know, new opportunities. Um, how, how can we really rethink um, how these spaces are designed to specifically address um, these problems of withdrawal? And so as part of this, um, I worked with um, my graduate assistants to kind of start to put together um, a catalog of NICU standards. Um, and so this kind of becomes our toolkit um, for putting together new design proposals. Okay, um, so with the time I have left, um, I'd like to talk about a few projects that I have worked on through my practice um, that kind of link up with um, or are extensions of um, the teaching and the research that I've been doing at the university. Um, so this is just sort of a sampling of some recent projects that I've worked on. Um, I work at a lot of different scales um, and with a lot of different uh, types of projects. Um, I, and one of the reasons is just that I have a lot of interests. Um, and uh, some of this work kind of um, connects to um, the healthcare and kind of um, uh, sort of public health issues that I've been interested in. Um, and then some of it is just kind of pure um, sort of architectural design um, and urban design. Um, so the four projects that I'm just going to briefly touch on um, are sort of some, a couple of them are connected to the work on opioids. Um, and then a couple of them um, deal with a second uh, sort of public issue that I'm really interested in has to do with incarceration and prison architecture um, and the process of re-entry, um, which I will describe in a few minutes. Um, so the first two projects um, kind of directly link with um, the, the public health questions that um, I've been interested in. Um, so this was a proposal for a methadone clinic um, in Venice, California, that was a response to um, a competition um, called Opioids, Architecture, and Emotions. Um, and so it kind of really centered the emotions of um, going through withdrawal and then um, getting sort of therapy and rehabilitation um, and how that can be manifested in um, a piece of architecture. So the site um, for this project, which is outlined in red, um, is very much kind of embedded in downtown Venice. Um, it's a very sort of urban and kind of exposed site. Um, and because of that, um, I was really interested in 
how to design the entry sequence to the building to create um, a kind of sense of privacy and to give um, people who are visiting um, a way to sort of feel like they can um, disappear into the building um, and sort of maintain a sense of safety. Um, so these are just some sketches kind of looking at um, different ways you can sort of move into the building in plan. Um, and then the, the building organization itself, it could have sort of ended up um, being organized around this long central spine um, with sort of communal spaces at the bottom, kind of shared spaces. Um, and then the, the second level would have sort of more private therapy rooms um, that sort of address the, the questions of the different kinds of emotions that emerge during um, the rehabilitation process. Um, and so the idea with that kind of first floor is that um, you have these sort of open and uplifting and more vertical um, communal spaces. And then the therapy rooms are actually um, smaller and more enclosed. And um, they're sort of designed around um, evoking the, the feelings of being in a cave or in a womb or in a cocoon. Um, trying to sort of evoke the emotions that come along with being in kind of a smaller space and feeling a safety come out of that. Um, and materially, the proposal um, is kind of uh, built around uh, this um, product called Channel Glass, which um, is sort of a vertical and um, translucent glass material. Um, and so this, this image that's kind of a dusk rendering shows um, that that material allows for the building to have a really prominent presence, um, especially at night. But the translucency also offers um, people who are using the building a level of anonymity um, if, they, if they want it. Um, and so this was kind of an example of really getting into the sort of finer details of a piece of architecture um, and to figure out how that can relate to kind of this bigger question of opioid use and rehabilitation. Um, the second project is, um, it's called Tuplex and um, it was also a competition proposal um, that I worked on a couple of years ago um, for a competition called Disruptive Design um, that was specifically for um, sort of creating an affordable, uh, affordable home typology for the typical Chicago lot. Um, and the reason that I wanted to show this is that it's taken on sort of a second life for me, um, given the experience that we've all had over the past year um, where we have had to um, work from home. And um, the proposal kind of built in um, different work from home opportunities. Um, and so I'm kind of returning to it and thinking more about it um, in the context of COVID. So the typical Chicago lot is 25 feet by 125 feet. Um, and this is just sort of in an example of uh, the kind of urban fabric that that creates in Chicago. Um, you've got these long, narrow lots, um, most of which tend to be filled by these sort of classic um, Chicago type buildings. So the two flat, the three flat, um, and then every once in a while we see this kind of side by side duplex um, that might take up two adjacent lots. Um, and I believe that um, between the two flat and the three flat, they make up about a quarter of Chicago's building stock. Um, so these are really, this is a really prominent typology. Um, and so this was, I felt a great opportunity to kind of think about how you can um, organize this for a kind of work at home situation. So the historic plans of these buildings, um, you know, they organize the rooms um, in this kind of long and narrow fashion. Um, and the rooms tend to be linked by kind of a single um, central hallway. And so you get that kind of what's called the sort of carriage style layout. Um, and so this is quite, some version of this is pretty ubiquitous um, in these longer lots in Chicago. 
And so what I wanted to do with this project is think about, um, again, uh, uh, opportunity for hybridization. Um, and so rather than thinking of the two flat or the three flat and the duplex as um, separate entities, what happens when we try to actually fold them together? Um, what kinds of um, new opportunities emerge when we think about hybridizing um, these these kind of classic typologies. Um, and so in the um, axonometric diagram, you can see that what you end up with is a kind of three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle where these two units kind of fit together. Um, one is sort of a larger house um, and one is a smaller apartment. And um, there's a couple of shared elements. There's a kind of a vertical um, mechanical, electrical and plumbing core that links all the levels together. And then there's a shared garage and stair at the back. Um, and what's kind of interesting about this is that the two units can work independently, but they can also work together as um, kind of a multi-generational home. Um, and in the context of COVID, the apartment can become a place where if someone needs to completely isolate, they can do that. Um, so so it's, it's kind of, interesting in the way that um, there's a kind of complete separation, but there's also very much a unity um, and kind of connection between the two if you want there to be. Um, and then the kind of the, the full building comes together um, as a kind of uh, new uh, thinking, sort of thinking about massing the massing of um, the two flat and the duplex in, in new ways. Um, and so these are what the floor plans look like. So um, the circulation spaces are um, really compact and efficient. Um, there's a kind of um, integration of um, open plan ideas with closed rooms. Um, and um, the, the blue here is um, the kind of apartment space and the yellow is the house space. And so you can see how there's kind of like different um, footprints on each level for those kind of going from the ground floor um, on the left all the way to the upper floor on the right. Um, and then I just pointed out here um, how the different office spaces sort of provide opportunities for work from home um, for any sort of combination or permutation of occupation of this building. Um, and the, the kind of urban scale dimension of this project um, was that in addition to sort of introducing a new typology to kind of infill um, some of the empty lots that were um, sort of pointed out by the competition organizers as part of the brief, um, there's an opportunity to create um, a different kind of uh, zoning um, with, with these kind of um, infill, uh, uh, sort of a third type of building that becomes an infill. Um, and so that's maybe a little bit more clear in this drawing. Um, and so thinking about, um, in addition to sort of introducing these new um, housing options, what happens when um, you sort of challenge the existing zoning condition um, and introduce non-residential buildings um, as kind of a network within that? Um, so thinking about um, sort of greater accessibility for day-to-day -day needs um, like a daycare or a pharmacy and also rentable office space for larger businesses. Um, and so these new forms would also create a, a kind of public courtyard condition so people can sort of um, cross through um, these blocks, not just at a street or an alley or through a gangway, but actually through a kind of courtyard. Um, and so again, this was sort of, this is a project that I did in a very different context. It was pre-COVID, um, but some of the issues that it brings up, I think are kind of even more relevant um, in our present moment. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of briefly talk about the next two projects. Um, Crossing the Skyline um, was also a competition proposal originally. Um, it was a competition hosted by the Chicago Architectural Club. Um, and the, the theme of the competition was crossing the line. Um, so they basically asked us to kind of choose a line in Chicago that was either visible or invisible um, and create 
um, an architecture or urban proposal that kind of um, transgressed it. And for me, the kind of really interesting question um, as part of the brief was how can the urban architectural collision and negotiation of two sides create a radical emergence of the unimaginable? And this is where I was actually really drawn to a particular site. Um, this is sort of one of the few times um, I think that I have kind of started with a site and developed a project from it. Um, but it, it has kind of a direct link to the, the issues-based design that I described um, at the beginning. So um, I'm sure many of you are familiar um, with this. This is um, the Harold Washington Library to the left and the Metropolitan Correctional Center to the right in downtown Chicago. Um, very different programs, very different building types. Um, the prison is a kind of slender facade um, that it almost looks fragile. Um, and the library is this kind of massive three-dimensional um, neoclassical block. Um, and so the line that I saw was the kind of invisible one between them where the library is about kind of um, intellectual expansiveness and openness and the prison is um, cellular and closed. And so the question for me is how do we cross this line? Um, and the, the, what's interesting about this particular site is that it's so different from uh, the kinds of prison typologies that we see elsewhere in the country. Um, prisons tend to be treated like islands. Um, some of them are literal islands, um, and if they're not literal islands, they're kind of um, organized in the landscape in a way that, that makes them function as such. Um, and so this site in Chicago is really unique. Um, and for me, it uh, sort of brought up an opportunity to kind of think about how can we um, think of new building types, again, sort of thinking about that question of hybridization. Um, how does that sort of um, help alleviate the issues that come along with incarceration um, and provide a way forward for kind of um, dismantling um, these really awful prison architectures that have emerged um, in our, our modern era. Um, and so the project ended up being sort of a literal bridge between the two. Um, and the, the program um, was to create a book annex where the library could move books into the space um, and people who are in the prison um, can visit with their families. Um, they can kind of use it as a reading room and as a classroom area. Um, and kind of have a, just a different architectural experience from what um, the Metropolitan Correctional Center provides. So this is a floor plan of what that looks like um, and a couple of collages that kind of give a sense um, of what that interior could be. And this project um, was then um, selected for exhibition at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and it's really interesting. There's kind of a long, narrow gallery um, in, the, in the building um, in downtown Chicago. And um, the curator, um, Joseph Altschuler, had um, sort of thought about uh, basically how to create um, a model of this long, narrow bridge proposal that would kind of fit into this gallery. Um, and so this is sort of a concept um, image sort of developing that. Um, and basically what, what this ended up uh, doing was we took a cross section of the proposal um, and built a model at a half inch equals one foot scale. Um, and what ended up happening was that at this scale, um, the, the portion of the model that represents Harold Washington Library um, became sort of like perfectly sized to hold books. Um, so it became a bookshelf. And so it was like, well, we sort of played with the, the scaled model versus kind of the one-to-one -one experience of the exhibit. Um, and it kind of opened up this question of, well, how do we, how could we address um, the question of literacy um, in a more tactile way, um, given that the project is kind of dealing with the library as a kind of compendium of resources um, and um, a kind of uh, a way to sort of um, increase literacy. Um, how can this project now, rather than just being a kind of cross section of the model, how can it kind of engage this other dimension? 
Um, and so I was able to kind of assemble a really interesting set of books um, with the assistance of um, three collaborators, the Education Justice Project, the Human Rights Defense Center, and then the University of Illinois Library. Um, and uh, it was a collection of texts that sort of specifically addressed the prison experience. Um, so it was texts that were written by people in prison um, and in particular sort of um, political um, people with political positions, political inclinations. Um, and, and then it was also dealing with um, the fact that there's a lot of censorship. So there's um, information that's kept out of prisons. Um, so I kind of grouped those into this idea of the the library that was kept in and the library that was locked out. Um, and so those were the books that ended up kind of occupying this exhibit, um, providing information to the visitors about um, different kinds of prison experiences um, and the questions of literacy and censorship. And so just to give you a little bit um, of background on this, so um, the exhibit was kind of um, very carefully detailed in um, three dimensions in Rhino. Um, we went through a kind of extensive fabrication process, um, creating the equivalent of shop drawings for every piece. Um, it was hand fabricated and installed in the gallery. Um, along with a kind of series of catalogs that um, documented all of the books that were presented um, and kind of talked about their uh, relationship to these questions of censorship. So these are just some images. Um, and then uh, the University of Illinois Library um, wanted to kind of bring this exhibit to the main library on campus as well. And so this was sort of a more um, modest installation. Um, but it highlighted uh, some of the texts that were um, used from the library in the exhibit. Um, and then it also gave me an opportunity to kind of do a different scale of fabrication um, to 3D print a kind of very small scale model of the proposal. Um, and so in general, I mean, I think the this project, um, it sort of helped me highlight um, the way that architecture could be a mechanism that's different from pub public policy to start to remake a system um, and sort of think about ways to dismantle some of that system's worst tendencies. Um, and so again, um, actually, as Danica mentioned at the very beginning, um, really thinking about design as a, a tool for kind of undoing some of the things that we have taken for granted. So the last project, um, I'm just gonna take a couple minutes uh, to go through, um, kind of extends uh, the question of um, how architecture has an interface with incarceration um, and how it can um, help alleviate some of the problems that go along with that. Um, so this is a project that is located in Champaign. Um, and we worked with an organization called First Followers, which is a re-entry program that basically um, provides services to people who have come out of prison um, and are sort of re-entering their communities. So it helps with job training, um, it helps with kind of resume building, um, and it's just, it's a really, really great local organization. So they were donated a house um, a couple of years ago and um, this is in uh, Champaign, and they wanted to basically convert the house into um, a community uh, learning lab. Um, and so my role um, was to kind of provide um, architectural guidance on that. Um, so I worked with them to kind of develop ideas about how they could um, reorganize the interior of the house. Um, and then my collaborator, Connor O'Shea, um, and his firm, Hinterlands, um, kind of worked with the organization on how they could think about the, the landscape, the backyard and the kind of side yard in the front in different ways. Um, so we were really, um, we weren't providing sort of construction level documents. It was more about um, overall design vision that then um, first followers and the scholars in um, their, their GOMAD program um, would be able to kind of take these ideas and um, implement them in the ways um, and sort of to the extent that they saw fit. So we worked with the scholars um, in kind of a series of training sessions, um, teaching them about sort of like the tools of construction and renovation. 
Um, we did a design charrette with them um, where we brought kind of like copies of the floor plan and we did overlays thinking about different ways that we could organize um, the interior of the house. Um, we did these um, sort of red lighting sessions um, in person. And then eventually um, Connor and I kind of put together a drawing set um, that they could use um, to receive permits, but then also um, to kind of, um, as, a, as a guide, um, as the scholars kind of learned uh, construction methods and tools um, in rebuilding this house. Um, so these are some of the drawings that we provided, um, some ideas about um, how to kind of create uh, planters in the landscape and decking. Um, and so in addition to sort of giving them a series of design images and drawings, um, we also provided them with a, um, what we called an ideas book. And I thought this was maybe one of the more interesting dimensions of this project, um, that rather than kind of um, over designing what would happen, um, especially in the landscape, um, we sort of gave them a catalog of different ways that they could, um, different things that they could plant, um, different ways that they could kind of um, make the landscape uh, productive. And it was really up to them sort of what they wanted to choose to do. Um, so I just have a few images from the ongoing construction here. Um, so this is uh, some of those planters in the backyard, um, some of the very robust vegetables that grew, um, and then just some images from uh, the interior in sort of different um, degrees of construction. Um, and so I wanted to end on this project because I feel like it's um, an important demonstration of architecture um, as a form of education. And so it's not just, I mean, there, there's the kind of the dimension, the social dimension to it, the kind of um, progressive dimension to it. Um, but what I really have been enjoying about this project so far is um, the way that uh, we've really been able to delve into the process. Um, just as much as the final product um, and to sort of really engage people who have maybe not had experience in construction or architecture before um, in these tools and methods. Um, so I am going to stop there um, and hopefully um, we'll be able to discuss a little bit more during the question and answer session. Um, thank you all very much.